Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our webinar dedicated to careers in private equity in Luxembourg. Uh, we have this series of webinars when we, where we speak to professionals in our field uh, so we can provide in useful information and insights for those who are looking for uh, a job in the field that we like very much. Uh, so today we have two guests uh, for the first time. Uh, we have John Holloway, who is currently the independent director, uh, but was previously the director of all private equity investments at uh, European Investment Fund, and Anne Hansen, the head uh, of unit uh, of resource management, uh, also at the European Investment Fund. Um, I before we start, I would like to remind you that uh, we have a career section on our website where you can leave uh, us your information, like a short CV, which we will gladly share with uh, our members. You can also find some useful uh, open vacancies that you might find interesting. So feel free to visit this section if you're looking for a job. Uh, Anne, John, good evening. Uh, I give the word to you uh, so you can introduce yourself in more detail so we know more about your incredible uh, experience and uh, uh, the job you do. Uh, let's start with John, uh, as uh, he's obviously our, uh, our <laughs> star. John, please. Thank you, Natalia. Good evening, everybody out there. I'm very, very pleased to be here this evening on this webinar, um, and I hope you, all of you who are out there find it useful and that you'll have some questions for Anne and I later on. Um, very briefly, I worked at the European Investment Fund for nearly 20 years, and for most of that time, I was the Director of Equity Investments, so looking after the front office, uh, new equity investments, the TIF, acting as a fund of fund and a limited partner investing into GPs, did over that period. We started off with four staff and about 500 million under management. And a few years ago when I left the business, we built it up to 84 staff with 16 billion under management. The aim of that mostly being European VC, technology VC, either life science or ICT, or lower mid, or lower mid market, which was the more generalist funds supporting SMEs in Europe, as that is the main reason that EIF exists. Um, most of the documents we ever saw always started with um, get outs, caveats, etc. And I'm afraid I must start with one too. Uh, as I retired from EIF full time working at EIF two years ago, Everything I say is not on behalf of the IF, it's based on the years that I spent there. So I'd just like to make that absolutely clear in the first place. Thank you. Anne, what about you? Ah, well, I, um, my name is Anne. I was born and raised in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, but came to Luxembourg uh, 31 years ago on a spur of the moment decision. I was only going to stay for three years, but I'm still here. I'm currently leading the unit, indeed, as you said, responsible for resource management at EIF, and I've been doing that for six years. Prior to joining EIF, I spent 25 years uh, at the European Investment Bank. So within the EIB group, I will celebrate 30 years of service next year. So a vast experience in very many different roles across, uh, across the organizations. Um, you both spent uh, well enormous time at the European Investment Fund. You be, you've been a part of it uh, for many years and uh, a part of the EIB before. And uh, my my first question for you would be um, like, what changes in the field and in recruitment in general uh, you see um, uh, for the last 10, 15 years? Well, I think. You know, Nothing much. No, I'm being, I'm being, I'm being brutally honest. Um, you know, we've been, we've been recruiting uh, both at the EIB. I did not do recruitment at the EIB. I was, I was in the EIB's front line, but in a role uh, interlinking with personnel. But at EIF, uh, for the last six years, recruitment has been uh, my passion, uh, and and we are recruiting and have been recruiting um, consistently for those six years. When I first joined the EIF, that was in the context of uh, of the so-called Juncker plan, uh, and there was a, there was a big recruitment uh, to be done, and we did that. 
And as you know, now we've got uh, we've got the the COVID situation going on, and we are therefore also heavily recruiting um, in the market today to to get the EIF properly staffed to to you know respond to that to that crisis. John, what about you? Uh, do you see any uh, uh, significant changes um, in private equity and the recruitment in private equity for, for the past 10, 15? I think that the, running the operational department, the transactional department, uh, recruitment was simply a, an everyday subject. It was never off the table. I don't think there was ever a time when the the investments department, the equity investments department in EIF ever had a full complement of staff. We always had places available and we were recruiting. So our, our inter interchanges with the people in HR between Anna and myself at the time was pretty much a daily, weekly occurrence. Um, it was not easy always to find staff. And even though we were not looking necessarily for seasoned investment professionals, in fact, rather the opposite, we were very happy to take people aged between, say, 27 and 30, uh, already with a first degree in a relevant subject, economics, accountants, finance, whatever, maybe doing um, a secondary um, type of qualification and we were happy to, if we found the right person, someone we believed could fit in, we'd bring them in, put them in a team of people who had more experience in investing and just gave them chance to find out whether the fund of fund business was something that appealed to them. It didn't appeal to everybody. Some came and went. Uh, a lot more came and stayed. And it's certainly a a longevity of the staff and inside that department and not massively heavy turnover either. So um, I would say there have not been huge changes apart from just the sheer numbers of staff who were needed and referred to the, the FC plan, the Juncker plan, which I think started in, in my, my memory now, 2013. At that time, we had to suddenly, we had about 25 um, jobs opened within that period because we had an extra two, two and a half billion to invest and we could not do that with the staff numbers we had. So that placed a pretty heavy burden on trying to find the people at the time. But the, the same, same idea stayed all the way through. Take people at a younger age rather than bring them in later on, see if they're good, give them a career path. Indeed. And John, you are a member of our HR club and you know uh, very well that uh, we address some uh, questions like um, uh, companies' needs uh, for professionals. And what are um, your uh, current needs? Uh, are you looking for people with um, relevant um, education? And do you ever have um, struggles in anything like administrative um, uh, problems or anything uh, of that sort. And uh, uh, what I'm also interested in, uh, how many uh, applicants do you actually have for, for one position? How, um, how um, uh, popular <laughs> are, are your open positions? <laughs> well, well, go on, and you take it. I can, I can, I mean, to, to go back to, to the beginning of your question, Natalia, I think the approach is still very much the same as what John described in terms of, of, of the, the, the profiles that we're looking for. If we get somebody in who's got, you know, fund the fund LP investment knowledge, that's a plus. But we certainly carry on bringing, you know, I call them young professionals, 27 to 30 year olds, um, and, and, you know, giving them the skill set and providing the training uh, that may be required on the job. Um, in terms of how popular are we? Well, <laughs> it really depends. I would say on average um, for our jobs in PE, I would not lie if I say we attract between 200 to 400 applicants per, per job opening. Uh, and, um, and John, um, 
I find that uh, you both are very, uh, very unique because you worked at uh, a European Investment Fund and previously at EIB uh, for, um, pro I think, more than 30 years. Uh, I think uh, probably John close to 40, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, how uh, is that possible that you stayed for so long? Because it's very rare. Uh, and uh, why did you stay there for, for so long? Well, I'll just come back first of all to the previous question because there's, there was never any shortage of applicants. Finding the right sort of applicant was never all that always that easy. But in EIF and the equity business, what we would do, we'd sort out the CVs and the ones that we thought were promising, the first thing we'd do was a telephone interview. And if the telephone, the telephone interview was always carried out by a couple of investment professionals, uh, they would ask technical questions and other questions besides. If the candidate came through that reasonably well, then we'd ask the candidate to come to Luxembourg for an interview. And that certainly saved a lot of time and helped us focus on the ones we, we thought really could make it. As, as for the question of, of time in EI, EI, EIB, EIF, like Anne, um, I came to Luxembourg way back in the last millennium and um, was intending to be here for four or five years before going on to somewhere else. I'd spent the previous four years in, in an international bank in the city. I left there and joined EIB because it seemed an interesting place to go. Um, if, I think with EIB and EIF, what I always really liked about both the organisations, and I spent the two together nearly 39 years with them, um, unthinkable when I first turned up here was the fact it was development finance but done with a commercial approach and that's something which appealed to me it's the organizations are not just there to make profits to make returns in financial terms there's more to it than that and I think if you're going to spend a long time in EIB or EIF if you want to I think you have to have that development attitude and development approach. If you have just a, you want to be in a financial institution that's making money and that's its, not its only driver, but its main driver, then the bank and the fund are probably not for you. I found that the ethos of the house appealed to me. I was very happy with it. I, I appreciated the teamwork, the fact it was multicultural, uh, multilingual. When I joined the IB, there were nine member states to that long ago. Um, Greece came just afterwards in 1981, and so it continued. But there were nine member states at the time, so nine nationalities. But the, the difference of working together with other nationalities, I found absolutely fascinating. It's something which I uh, really enjoyed, and it, it's, it's part of what can be offered. In EIF's terms, I think what, what EIF in its equity business offers is a panorama that no other company can possibly match. Uh, if you're an investment professional in the VC team or in the low mid market team, you can be working on a deal on, in Sweden one day and next week can be on a deal in Greece or Portugal. You're dealing with completely different people in different markets which are not at the same level of development and you have an opportunity to see that where no other fund of fund can give you anything like the sheer size and, and the magnitude of, of availability of, of funds to look at. And I think that's very, very appealing to some people. And uh, Anne, I remember you told me that you wake up with a smile on your face. <laughs> so I'm sure you have something <laughs> to say fun. about it. <laughs> I mean, I, my, my, my career path within the organization has, has been fantastically interesting and rewarding. Um, I joined the EIB in one type of position as a, as a very, very young lady back in the day. I was only, as I said, going to stay for three years. Then I was going to head back home to, to Copenhagen. But I'm through working with, and, and John said, this within this multicultural environment with such talented people. I was lucky enough uh, to be thrown opportunities my way to try one thing and then to move to another part of the organization and bring my skill set there and learn something new, move to another part of the organization. Again, bringing some knowledge into that area, but 
you know, getting new skill sets. And I think it's important. My, my prime importance is, as you said, I'll wake up with a smile on my face every day. I enjoy very much what I do. Um, and, and that is paramount for any job in the world, whether it's, uh, you know, at the EIB group or um, uh, or anywhere else is, is you have to enjoy what you do. And, and I think I speak for all of, of the staff at EIF when I say we're all very passionate about working at the EIF. Um, there is a great sense of teamwork across the whole organisation, even though we've grown tremendously over the time that I've been there. I think we've grown by two, nearly 200 uh, staff over the course of six years. Um, but certainly at the EIB, when I joined the EIB, I think we were 550 staff members and now the EIB count 3,500. So you can you can imagine the growth and the influx uh, that has happened during the course of those 30 years. And that's what's kept it interesting. I'd like to echo that as well, Anne, because in the time I was in, in the bank and the fund, I worked in six different departments in two different countries. Luxembourg, I also spent some time in the Rome office of EIB. The amount of variety I got was absolutely remarkable. So rather than finding it necessary to maybe leave and go to a different address, I found plenty to interest me on a daily basis, but being at the same address. Um, and that is what one of the things that kept me there all the time. I'm very happy to. And do you know many people uh, besides you? Do you know someone else who stayed there for, for so long? Or are you like, completely unique? <laughs> no, no. There, I, no. I, was, I was there nearly 39 years. There are people who've, go, who've done more than that. Um, it's, it's not the normal thing because at the time I started, I was only 26. And the, the, the age then when people were being taken in was closer to 30. But it was not unusual. That, that generation, the generation of the 80s and the 90s, were, which counts down and I, there are quite a few of them still around inside the bank and the fund. Uh, the two people who were, in fact, three people who were closest to me during my time in the fund are all still there. We all work together on the equity and the guarantees business. Um, I'm very pleased to see they are still there. There's a stability which was is quite remarkable. And I think that's driven by a wish to feel that you in some way are contributing to the development of the European Union. That, that, that for me is the fundament uh, of why you're there. And that's, that's what keeps you coming in every day because I personally I find that absolutely fascinating. And um, uh, for people who are not yet at the <laughs> At this stage, uh, uh, do you, uh, like what would you recommend uh, uh, for people um, who are just uh, probably starting and at the, uh, are still at the beginning of their um, career path? What do you think is important um, uh, to succeed uh, in, uh, in the career? Um, I'll leave that one to you, Bill. <laughs> no, you know, I think curiosity and, and agility and adaptability uh, are going to be my three main words. Um, you're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days, but you're also going to have great days. And it's not to take the not so good days and let them perhaps overwhelm you. Um, I think it's important to, uh, I think it's important to change jobs. I think it's important to grow. I think um, that, oh, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, no, because my my thing went on the blink. I'm terribly sorry. Let me just log back on my screen. Just decided to close down just a minute. Uh, and then I'll be with you again. I think you, I've, I always say to, I've always said to myself, you are the owner of your own career. So if you sit back and wait for everybody else to make your career for you, it could happen, but it's not very likely to happen. So it's about taking taking your career in your own hands and, and going in the direction that you want to go in. I started my very, very first job when I was when I was fresh out of high school in Denmark. I was just going to have a gap year. I was going to go to university and study law. Um, was in personnel, actually. It was in HR. 
And, and then I went off and did a lot of other things for many years and, uh, and now find myself back with my, with my first love, as I call it, working in, working in HR, which is where I find my, my professional satisfaction. So find your, own, you know, find your own goals and go for them. And, and don't be intimidated by looking at maybe a job description, be it at, uh, within the EIB group or, or elsewhere, where you think, oh, but I don't tick all the boxes. No, you may not tick all the boxes, but maybe with a bit of support and development, you can tick all the boxes. If you tick the, the primary boxes, the minimum boxes, then, then it's certainly worth trying to, to put your name forward for it. Yeah, I think when, when I started many years ago, my first, my first departmental director um, was a, a quite remarkable gentleman. And we had one or two disagreements at the beginning. But after a while, I was able to demonstrate to him that I could probably do the job reasonably well. And at that stage, he gave me the freedom to do the job. And I, at, a, I think at 26, I found myself in EIB with a far greater degree of freedom to operate than I had where I'd been before in the city. Part of that was a management style where the guy in Luxembourg was able to give me that. In London, I didn't get quite so much freedom. And I, that certainly had an effect on me over the years because it means that I've always tried to manage people on the basis that I'm not standing by looking over your shoulder, watching you all the time. Please demonstrate to me you can do the job. And I'm absolutely delighted to give you the freedom to do it. Um, staying in contact and reporting on what you're doing. Um, the bank and the fund have given me that. I've had some fascinating people to work with and work for, but by and large, I've, I've been happy to have a situation where I've been allowed to, to get on with it and deliver the results. Indeed. And, and what about uh, well, multitasking uh, at, uh, at, at EIF? Like, uh, because there are different two types of companies, big companies. Uh, sometimes uh, everyone is assigned to do one particular thing. And there are companies which uh, give people the opportunity uh, to multitask and explore different uh, types of tasks. Uh, what kind of a company are you and why do you think it's uh, important to be like that? I'm going to take that John, you want me? Yeah, sure. I'll take that one first, on if I may. Um, Again, coming back to EIB, come to EIF in a minute, coming back to, to EIB, I was involved in the, the loan business and I did loan admin, I did credits, I did front office setting up new deals and people were encouraged to move backwards and forwards because if, you, if you've done both credit, admin and front office new loans, you're probably a more rounded professional than if you've just done one part of it. So you were motivated, stimulated to move around and move across. Within EIF, staff move between one department and another, and that's seen as something which is very helpful potentially to your career, rather than staying in the same place all the time. Uh, I think that's very helpful to people. It gives them a, a chance to see other parts of the house that otherwise they might not. Indeed. And, and like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I touched upon it before, the job I do today, I could not do had I not done the jobs I did before, um, because I've grown uh, as a person and as a professional throughout my career. Um, and there's no, there's not one job, I think, John, correct me if I'm wrong, at EIF where you're just doing one thing, irrespective of where you are in the organisation. There's such a wide variety uh, of, of responsibilities within each position that, you naturally multitask every single day, but if you you feel that you know you've mastered all of the elements of the job that you're in and and, and you wish to change, then we have got a very good internal mobility um, scheme going on both within the EIF uh, as an organisation, but also as both John and I are are good examples of between the EIF and the EIB. And it's, it's also good to remember that EIF is not just an equity business. It also has a product family of guarantees, <clears throat> excuse mm -hmm. me, and it has a, a substantial middle office, back office function. It, it has its own legal service. It has its own 
credit review process. It has its own mandate management teams, the guys who have to go out and actually find the money that EIF then invests. So there's a plethora of possibilities within EIF uh, requiring all kinds of different um, backgrounds and levels of expertise. Um, and people can change between one thing and another, and it happens frequently. So mm. it's good to see. And uh, uh, let's talk about the, the actual hire, uh, hiring process. Uh, the, I think this year uh, for some companies it was uh, quite difficult. Uh, and I would like to ask you, uh, how do you see the hiring process uh, this year? If you still hire and um, if you see the same uh, level as, let's say, the previous year? Well, us, us in the hiring team have been particularly busy this year. Um, obviously, circumstances considered, uh, most of us are, are still working from home. We've had to make slight adaptations to our process, but they're really minor. Uh, where John said before, typically people would come into, we would fly people to Luxembourg for in-house interviews. We've had to take all this uh, via video conferencing. But apart from that, uh, you know, we have carried on recruiting throughout the year. I think part of, the reason, part, of the, part of the reason behind this as well is that the, the bank and the fund are used very much by other European Union organisations, in particular the Commission, and the European Commission is a shareholder in the EIF, because the EIF, to my knowledge at least, used to be, if it isn't still, the only, Euro the only European Union organisation that has um, uh, a public-private partnership um, shareholding. So apart from the bank and the commission, there are also, I think there are about 30 banks and insurance companies which are shareholders in EIF. And those shareholders have frequently mandated money to EIF for EIF to, to look after and invest on, it on, on their behalf and at their risk in return for a fee. And this means that actually <clears throat> it might seem slightly strange, but at the times when Europe has had its difficult periods is exactly when the bank and the fund are called upon to do even more. So in 2013, Indeed. when um, President Juncker came up with his plan, which was Europe still suffering quite a bit from the events of 2008, 2009, uh, the European Commission turned to the bank and the fund to provide services. And the same happened with the Guarantee Fund now, where the Commission wants to use the bank and the fund uh, to provide services, which the, where the Commission will provide the money, and the bank and the, the fund deploy the money on, on the Commission, the European Union's behalf. So in the good times, there's always business to be done. In the less good times, there's even more business to be done. Indeed. And uh, uh, it's a, a tricky question, but, um, you know, when you hire people, um, all uh, candidates are different. And as you said before, uh, there are many people who apply uh, for the same positions. And uh, how, um, if I apply, uh, then how would I be visible uh, among these candidates? What do you uh, pay attention to? Um, who do you notice? <laughs> But look, I always always say a, a well-written motivation letter is the best start. Um, there is, I find it discouraging if I see a motivation letter that says, "See my CV." No, present you know, present yourself, present your background. Uh, don't have to go into detail as much as what you have done before because your CV speaks about that. But but intrigue, uh, you know, the hiring manager and why you want to come and work for the EIF, why you are. Are you see yourself a good match for the position? Um, what you bring to the EIF? And John, what was think, what was important? I think, I think what we're looking for is a candidate who has some kind of what can I call it? USP. A candidate who stands yeah, who stands out from other candidates, um, preferably for the right reasons. Um, 
candidates who've who've had taken the time just to to learn a little bit about what the fund is, what it does, why it's there. Um, I used to talk to some of the newcomers inside the fund because the fund, I assume it still does it now, gets together on a regular basis, the recent arrivals and has the, the, the directors inside the organization to come and talk to the people, tell them what, what they're doing inside the organization. And I always used to ask the people then, um, how big was EIF, who were the shareholders, uh, what was the operating profit last year, just to see amongst the, the people who were there, the ones who were, had taken the time to get clued up on the organization itself. And it would the, the, I'm pleased to say that most of the time, most of the people in that room could answer the questions I asked them. I couldn't always answer all of theirs, but at least they seemed to be able to answer mine. So I think that was probably the right way around. And Anne, what would be uh, like? What would be your red flag uh, for a non-hire? Like, what's uh, uh, what do you consider as a failure when people come uh, to the interview uh, or before the interview, and you know that this is a no? <laughs> Well, look, it, for me, and, and it goes back a little bit to, to what John said. Now, we obviously have a screening process um, and, and therefore, you know, you, you go through, you have your pool of candidates to do your first screening. The pool goes down a little bit because, you know, we screen, do people have the relevant university degrees? What is the professional experience? Do they meet the minimum requirements? The first level of screening is really, you know, do the candidates in the pool meet the minimum requirements for the EIF? Um, and there we have to have, uh, for our professional staff, you have to have, uh, you have to be um, an EU national, so EU 27 or one of the five uh, candidate countries. That is that is one screening criteria. Secondly, um, university degree, preferably at postgraduate level, but bachelor's is also uh, uh, is fine. And third level is years of relevant professional experience. So the minimum is three. So minimum three years of, of experience in a financial institution, in a big four. Um, so those, those are, like, you know, um, let's call our main, you know, our first main basic screening levels. Um, then, you know, the process goes through, as John mentioned earlier on, uh, telephone interviews. Uh, that's when, so the, the hiring manager together with one or two of his team members do telephone screens with, with the candidates that were retained on the long list. Now there, they will typically ask questions like what John just explained, um, that he would ask the people that we'd already hired. We actually, we asked them through the process because for me, it's important that a candidate's prepared, that the candidate has spent, you know, a little bit of time. I'm not asking for, you know, a full rendition of our of our annual report. That is certainly not what we're asking candidates to do, but but to know that they've taken the time to, to look into what the EIF does, why we are here um, and what we do. Uh, because, you know, that's we are unique and we like to think we're unique, but we also like people to, to take the time and, and, and prepare for that. That is important for me. Um, so we have we have sometimes experiences where we get to the final interview and, and we ask the candidate, so tell us what we know about the EIF. And the person goes, I didn't have the time to look. And for me, that's a little bit of a red flag. It's just, you know, um, it's not what I'm looking. It's not what I'm looking for, ideally, in a candidate. Somebody who, who kind of just goes into the interview unprepared. Um, big no-nos. Um, you know, it's it's difficult to say because it's you know we assess each candidate on the basis of the interview. By the time we get to the in-house interviews, which are now video screening, they've gone through uh, online assessments. They've gone through a technical test as well. So the 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 last bit is the is the is the online. Um, video calls for the moment typically in normal terms we would meet at headquarters in Luxembourg um, so do I have any disastrous stories to share with you not really to be honest with you um, no I think I am privileged to be honest with you to meet so many fantastic uh, people from around Europe and beyond um, in the course of, of my duties and and some are hired and some are not uh, but I, I am extremely uh, you know privileged as i said to to have this kind of gateway to to the european job seekers um so there you go 
And I think I'd add to that, Natalia. I'd add to that, Natalia. The uh, and it's not it's not rocket science. Everything that Anne has said to me is pretty boilerplate. It's, just, it's pretty obvious as well. Um, and the other obvious thing is, if you write something on a CV and claim to have done it or be able to do it, then you might need to be able to justify that if you're questioned. And one of the things I found on a couple of occasions with candidates, maybe it's because it was to a European organisation, was an ability to speak certain languages. And sometimes that gets tested. And when it's tested, you find that sometimes the uh, the knowledge of the language is, is, is just, quite frankly, not what it says in front of me on, on the CV. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. If you, if you don't speak Italian, don't tell me you do. I'll just give that as an example. And I think I just wish to underline that we don't, you know, the, the working language of the EIF, the official working language is English. and. and and we expect all of our employees to have excellent English skills, both all and in writing. Um, but as John said, if you speak additional European languages, it, it certainly is. It's an it's it's an asset. Uh, but make sure that you do. Um, you know, if you list it on your application. Because uh, uh, you will, you will be tested. It will be an Italian or a Greek or a, somebody along the hiring process who will test it. Uh, and I have a, a small question for you. Uh, what, uh, what do you think about the importance of a cover letter? Because I know uh, some people, uh, they think it's uh, not necessary at all, but I know that you have opinions. No, I, I, think, I think a cover letter is an introduction. Uh, a CV speaks of the, of the background and the achievements and the, tech, and, and, and the technical and educational skill set. But a cover letter for me is an introduction of the person. So for me, I, I, I truly enjoy a well-written cover letter. I will, I will be honest with you. Uh, John, I don't know how you see it, and you've certainly recruited enough people as well. To, to me, it's, um, it's the opportunity for the, someone to tell me a list, something a little bit different about them. The CV tends to be regularly, sort of, probably follows a certain <laughs> format. The, mm. the, the cover letter gives gives the person a chance just to to show the in inverted commas USP I referred to earlier. A, a good I always looked at the cover letter before I looked at the CV. Um, going back uh, also to, to what you said, and uh, you said that you are uh, usually hiring from uh, European Union countries. Uh, do you ever? higher from outside the European Union? Because this is a question that we get a lot yeah. during the webinars. And fair enough. Um, no, to work, at, to work within the EIB group, EIB or EIF, you must hold the nationality of one of the EU 27 member states or one of the five accession countries. Now, you don't have to live within Europe, but you must hold the nationality. We have high, we have brought people to, to Luxembourg uh, from Abu Dhabi, from America, from but they are EU nationals, and that is that is a the first criteria uh, you must meet is to have EU nationality or that of of an accession country. Uh, and I'm, I also have a question about uh, internships. Do you ever uh, do internships, or as you said before, you only hire? Uh, when people have the uh, relevant experience already of three years and more? That's a great question. No, we do. We have an internship program at, uh, at EIF. We uh, have up to 26 uh, interns traveling through the corridors of EIF, of EIF during the course of the calendar year. Our internships are, are project based. So the, um, the relevant business area will, will, have a, will, have, will write a business case on the project what they need the intern to do, what, what are the goals and the expected outcome of the project. And then these internships are published on our, on our website. Uh, and, you know, we get, we have, depending a little bit, again, which, which area of the organization is, whether it's legal, whether it's marketing, whether it's finance, whether it's risk, um, we have strong interest in our internships. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, up to 26 projects are published during the course of a calendar year. So, we're very much open to interns as well. And they are for a period of five months, our internships. 
Uh, and um, in in terms, I think we we slightly touched uh, th this topic. Uh, uh, during our conversation, but um, when when you hire people, uh, do you pay more attention uh, to their experience or um, to their um, like education and um, uh, skill? Let's say skills. <laughs> I think I, I don't think there's one that's more or the other. I think everything is important because, um, as I said, by the time we get to the by the time we get to the in-house interviews and, and potentially the job offer, we have tested. You know, we've looked at the educational background. We've even discussed it probably in the interview. The candidates have been asked to undertake a technical test linked to uh, the job requirements, so we can measure where they are in terms of their ability to perform the tasks that are needed for, for the position. Um, and, and, you know, we look at, again, we discuss in the interview, but it certainly goes through the process. We look at the, the experience that the candidate has had prior to potentially joining the EIF. So I don't think there's one that's more important than the other. For me, it's, it's a global package of everything that has to, to fit together for the particular role that we're recruiting for. I don't know if, John, you've got anything to add there. Not really, and I think that's, that's, that's the process with in the equity business, new arrivals from the outside were taken because we saw potential in that person to, to want to develop him or herself in the fund of fund business that the TIF, the TIF used. Um, that's really what we were looking for, the, the, the ability, the, the wish to do something which is it's, it's still quite a niche business. You know, the fund of fund business is, is very big, I grant that, but uh, within the overall panoply of, of things, the fund of fund business is, is not huge. And because it's rather niche, you know, we think it's well worth supporting and finding, <laughs> finding, more, finding more about it. We just want people who have that wish to learn to, to come and develop and give something to the organisation and get plenty back. Indeed. Yes, and uh, about the wish uh, to learn, I think we also touched it slightly, but uh, to be more concrete, when you work uh, at EIF, uh, uh, do you encourage your employees to go through different trainings uh, or uh, do you support them if they want to get, um, a, let's say, another education or go through some courses, um, of course, related to the job? I think learning and development is very important. Um, the EIF offers, we have an in-house training portfolio uh, that covers a, a wide uh, variety of things. We have some mandatory trainings, we have some, some available trainings, but we also, um, I know the individual departments, they, they send uh, staff members to training outside of, of the EIF with their specific technical training that is important or uh, relevant to the staff member, then they, you know, that can be organised. We also at the EIF and the EIB group um, support people who wish to. Typically, we have staff who want to uh, become ACCA qualified, or they want to do an MBA, or and and there is there is also uh, there's also support. Uh, you know, of course, not everything everything is is accepted up front, but but there is support in the in the development of our staff. Absolutely. Um, because what they invest in, they bring back to the organisation. Yeah, certainly a lot of the staff in the equity teams were doing CFAs or something equivalent outside, outside the work time. And <laughs> one of the single biggest differences in the, in the business uh, when I was there was the, the increase in the amount of regulation in particular and the... EIF arranges in-house courses, which are mandatory um, for certain aspects of the um, so that staff are aware, and this is all staff, it's not just um, transactional staff. All the staff in the EIF, I believe it's the case, and have to go through the trainings on money laundering, um, know your client, um, regulate yep. new regulations which are constantly coming in so that everybody is absolutely aware of what their responsibilities are. It's not because you have a job that's way up, a long way away from front office that you don't need to know what the regulation is on, on aspects which are coming out really all the time. 
and the fund provides that. In fact, it, it is mandatory, and mandatory means exactly what it says. You have to do it. Okay. And uh, I also have one question. It's it's my favorite, one of my favorite topics. It's the it's the mindset and the life life work balance in uh, in this field and in private equity in particular. And what I would like to ask is that: uh, Do you think that uh, in the job that you do uh, and John in private equity in particular, it is possible uh, to have this life work balance? And do you think that a nine to five man mindset could actually work in this? Field. And how, how much how, how much do you actually work uh, per week? <laughs> I'm not going to answer the last question, <laughs> especially not after being in home office. Um, and John, I will, I will maybe let you answer first on, on the PE side. Mm. Um, nine to five. I can vaguely <laughs> remember that when I was very young and in, in my first job way back when, before I started a career, and it didn't work then. And it's never worked since. Uh, there are times when you have to put in the hours to get the job done, get the deal through, uh, whatever that deal could, could be. If you need to stay late and you have to stay late on another day, you can hopefully compensate. Uh, the idea of your, your work and your play in your life, um, I can only refer to my own example. I've been very fortunate. I, have a relatively happy family here in Luxembourg. Um, there were tough times when I wasn't there, particularly traveling quite a lot, which was very disruptive. But uh, in the end, um, it, it, it's worked out. Just, you have to do the hours you have to do. Um, sometimes it, it's not going to be eight hours a day or seven hours a day. Uh, you, you, when the work is there, you have to be there to do it, depending on the level of responsibility you have as well. Honest, yeah, no, I think I think you know uh, to follow up on what Jordan said. What what we do strive to 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 ensure is that staff at the EIF have a healthy work life balance. But to call it a nine to five is probably difficult to say. So I'll go back to what John said. You will have days that are busy, maybe days that are longer. Um, but these days are compensated on other days where you you then you know you stop a little bit earlier. Um, but uh, but overall, I would say there is uh, there is a, a good work life life balance at the EIF, but it also depends on on you know what what what's on the program for the moment. Um, you know when we went into when we went into the home working arrangements, uh, it was all a bit it was all a bit messy, and we all had to find our way, and we probably all did hours that were that were a little bit silly in the beginning because it was so new to us. But this this new way of working has now become routine unfortunately I, I really do miss the human contact there's a reason why i'm in hr yeah. it's because i like working with people um so you know being here on the screen with john is just it's fantastic for me because this, i feel like i'm having a proper interaction but you know i think overall there is a good balance there will be certain areas of the business maybe where the balance is less good there will be other areas where it's fantastic but it's on an overall, I think, John, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think overall at the EIF and in the EIB group, yes, we do have, we do strive to have a good work-life balance. Yes. All right, and uh, before uh, we pass to Q and A, and we have uh, several questions, please, if you uh, if you want to ask something, uh, feel free to use the Q and A section. Type in your question, and we will answer. Uh, so before before that, um, just to close our conversation, uh, during uh, the last webinar that we had with uh, Alan from Big Four, um, uh, the thing that he said that. Uh, if you want to succeed uh, in your career, uh, you have to treat um, the company you work in as your own uh, and that it cannot be just a work or the work you treat well. So uh, do you agree with this? Um... <laughs> Go on, John, you start. So treat the place. Sorry, Natal, look, no, make sure I've understood treat the the place where i work as as my own yes as your own as your company, company. Like your 
home, <laughs> you know, oh, like home. you are fully responsible for it. Yes, I suppose. Yeah, I, I felt that particularly at, at, when I started, I was responsible for deals. I always wanted to make sure that the deal was as robust as it possibly could be. I felt a, a, a very great degree of responsibility. Uh, as things moved on and I moved away from uh, deals and pieces of paper towards people, uh, the sh there was a, a quantum shift there because a dossier won't talk back to you, but people do. Uh, it didn't shift my field of responsibility for the people who were part of the team that I was in or leading. And you can't get on with everybody. There'll be some people who are, are more challenging than others, but that's the beauty of teamwork is everybody getting together and doing it and accepting the level of responsibility and looking to go to the next stage of the level of responsibility is I think part of it. Uh, if, you, if you work for a place, you need to know about it and you need to subscribe to its ethos. And mm. I hope I did that. I'm not the one to judge it. The people who work <laughs> with me and around me can answer the question far better than I would even dare to try. Um, I'm going to add on to what John said, and, and it goes back maybe, Natalia, to the beginning of our conversation. How is how John and I managed to stay within the same organization for that many yeah. years. Um, is it, do I treat the EIF as, is it's my own company? I wouldn't say that, no, but I have great respect for the EIF. And, and I think it's, it's a mutual, respectful relationship, uh, me versus EIF and EIF versus me. And that is, that is a partnership that goes well hand in hand. So I don't treat it like it's my own, um, but but I have I've great respect for for what the organisation does, and I'm I'm terribly proud to be part of it. Um, and 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 I've enjoyed you know now nearly thirty years overall um, across across the EIB group. Um, so that will be my answer. Maybe is is mutual respect uh, along yeah. the way. Here, here. Right. Thank you. And uh, let's pass uh, to the Q&A. And the first question that I have uh, is, uh, is also about uh, the hiring within the European Union. Uh, so we have uh, Alessandro who's asking if you have preferences for candidates outside Luxembourg. Not at all. Uh, no. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't look at when, when we start the, the hiring process, we don't look necessarily at where candidates sit today, whether they're in Luxembourg, in France, in Germany, in Greece, that's irrelevant. We look at what the, what the candidate brings vis-a-vis -vis the job that we're trying to fill. Yeah. Uh, and then Christine is asking that uh, EIF is hiring new teams. Impact investing seems to be the last one. What's new? John, can you tell more about impact investment? Yeah, well, impact investing. There was one of my colleagues who's a bit of a specialist in impact investing. In fact, he was there well before most of the rest of the world even knew what it was. He was studying this and did a, a, a sort of a, a real study on it in 2011, I think. His view is that sooner or later, every equity deal that he's done will be an impact investing deal because you can't get away from the fact that impact investing is becoming the most, or maybe has already become, the, the most important aspect of any deal. So it is a specific heading. It has teams inside EIF also on the mandate management side who are specializing on impact investing. But um, eventually it will maybe come to the stage where we still say that we're online, but uh, it's just part of the deal. It's what you do. It's impact investing is rolled up inside the deal you look at. Uh, all right. And then uh, we have uh, two questions. Uh, I think one uh, we uh, slightly also attached when we spoke about the languages uh, as uh, requirements. Uh, so the question is how critical it is to be fluent in more than one non-English uh, language. And I think we probably answered that already. Um, and uh, another question is... 
Your skill sets uh, do you believe today are most valuable to entry level uh, applicants? Oh, um, so in terms of technical skills, yes. well, I, you know, uh, financial analysis is a good one. <laughs> um, I think, John, you can probably answer more specific, precisely because it depends obviously on the job. If you're in PE, John, typically you would look at, uh, I assume, candidates coming from, from backgrounds like uh, audit in big force transaction services, uh, if they've done audit at PE funds, that's an asset. Uh, having worked in financial in, in in mergers and acquisitions, I think also no, John. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, as the most, basic. Yeah, most of the candidates that I can recall were probably they'd done a few years in one of the the big four accountancy firms and various parts of an accountancy firm, not necessarily audit, but other parts besides. Um, mm -hmm. That's the technical bit we're looking for. Also looking for people who are willing to embrace working in a team. Uh, some people prefer team to work. to work more alone. Some people prefer to prefer to be in a group. And I think it's IDIF. No, nobody works alone. You you always have somebody with you. Uh, to bounce ideas off, to check things with, to refer to, just to discuss generally what it is in front of you, and that it, you need to be you need to be able to talk with people rather than talk to people, and that I think is a very important little change of proposition. And you know, teamwork is indeed one of our core competencies across the EIB group. You have. It, you have to enjoy it um, because I think no matter what you do, uh, you're part of a team at some point in time, whether it's your team within the unit that you work with, whether it's a project team across across the organization, whether you're in a team on a transaction. So teamwork is is paramount uh, and, and enjoyment of, of, of working in teams is, is, is very important. Thank you. And uh, I have another question about the <laughs> hot topic, which is always a hot topic. Um, what is the reason uh, why you do not hire non-European Union <laughs> nationals? We can't. Because we're a European <laughs> Union organization. Exactly. We're an EU organization and therefore we hire people from the EU member states and, and accession countries. Okay, so I think that we probably, uh, I don't see more questions, so I hope we answered all of them. And thank you very much for joining us today, Anne, John. Thank you very much for your time, for your insights, for all the information. Uh, I would like to remind you that this webinar will be uh, available uh, in a recorded version on our YouTube channel, so you can always rewatch it again. Uh, thank you again, uh, and we will uh, 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 announce now a, co a couple of um, events which are coming next week. Um, so it's um, uh, one uh, of the events is the uh, webinar organized by uh, our Wealth Management Club, uh, which will be about private equity for individuals. Um, uh, why not to you? And uh, on the 9th of December, we will have a, a webinar dedicated to uh, Brexit, which is coming very soon, uh, shortly mm -hmm. than one month. Thank you very much. Uh, and see Can you I just say one thing? Yes. Can I just encourage if anybody is interested in, in, in pursuing a career at EIF, that they visit our website uh, and our work with us section. Uh, all of our opportunities are published there, be it uh, a position or an internship. We, we go through there and we will also keep in touch with you, Natalia, obviously, um, to make sure that you have an insight in what we're looking for. Thank you so much. Thank you. We can also share the CVs of, uh, of those who apply through our website. Uh, we will gladly share uh, with you as well, because they always apply uh, if they're interested in this particular uh, field. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, have a nice evening and uh, see you next year. <laughs> Thank you, Natalia. Thank you very much for having us. Um, Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.